Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. We have four chapters again before us today. We're going to start with Genesis chapter 40, and then we have Job chapter 6, and then in the New Testament we have Mark 10 and Romans 10. And again, if there's any questions or comments that you have, feel free to post those in the comments section below. Uh, otherwise, let's uh, take a look at what we've got here. First of all, Genesis chapter 40, and we are still with Joseph here, and he's still in prison. And uh, here we meet the, uh, the baker, the cupbearer, and the candlestick maker. Well, at least two out of the three. We got the baker and the cupbearer, and uh, they each have a dream. And Joseph, by God's uh, special divine gift to him, is able to interpret accurately what the dreams mean. And he interprets for them that the cupbearer is going to be uh, honored, exalted, and the baker is going to be put to death. And uh, it happens in this way, uh, just as he says, after they interpret the dreams. But then uh, we read at the very end of the chapter, last verse I think it is, that the cupbearer forgot about Joseph. And so it just, all of this is building, of course. As I said before, we're, we're getting somewhere with the story of Joseph. But so far, again, it just seems to be problem after problem for Joseph, even though God is doing good through him. So, you know, he, he's thrown into this pit. He's sold into slavery. He's, you know, accused of doing something he didn't do. He's thrown into jail. He's forgotten in jail. Uh, but each step along the way, God's presence is with him and is blessing him. And, of course, ultimately, this is all going to work out for good, just as uh, God promises in Romans chapter 8. And so a great example of it, but it's, you know, I always think about Joseph and I think about the day to day, you know, here he is in jail, forgotten in jail and just the day to day difficulty of what he's seeing, what is in front of his face. And, you know, so often we judge our you know lives based on just today, just, okay, here's what's going on in my circumstances today. And, you know, we think that this is only bad. It can only be bad. But the reality is, if we trust God's word and believe that, you know, what God says in his word, then he is doing good. His plan is ultimately good. And we can't see the beginning from the end. Only God can see the beginning from the end. And so he calls us to, to trust that, that truth, that promise, even though in the midst, in the day-to-day -day here, you know, just like what Joseph was experiencing, it might be very difficult. All right, turning then over to... Job chapter 6. And so Job had spoken, and then Eliphaz uh, responded, and now Job speaks again, his second speech. And it's kind of a response to Eliphaz's speech. Basically, he's saying, you know, that I have a right to be upset uh, because, again, Job is aware of the fact that he's not being punished because of what he has done, because of sin, uh, just to, unlike what Eliphaz is accusing him of. And so, you know, he. He's, he thinks that, you know, he, he, he has a right here to, to say to God, hey, you know, what's going on? But then he says to his companions, basically, you guys are worthless. You're helpless. Uh, you, you, you know, you're not, you're not adding anything to this because you're inaccurate in your assessment of the situation. And, uh, and so, again, this goes, uh, you know, to the truth. He, he points out here that he did not curse the Holy One, which is true, which is just as God said to Satan. By the way, it's one of the important things about this book. God has to be right because he's God. And so when God says to, uh, to to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan, in essence, says, well, he only honors you because of what you've done. You put a hedge around his life. And, you know, but God, in essence, is saying, no, that's not the case, that Job would honor me anyway. And so it's important to see that God was right. Job is continuing to honor him, but he wants an answer. He's looking for an answer to what why is this happening? And clearly the answer that Eliphaz has given is wrong. It's inadequate. And Job knows that it's wrong. He says, you know, what good are you guys? Um, all right. Then turning over to the, uh, to the New Testament, Mark chapter 10. And we're just about to the triumphal entry already in the Gospel of Mark. Again, this is just how fast this book moves, how quickly, you know, it summarizes Jesus' ministry. Uh, but two things that I wanted to bring out of this chapter. One, again, Jesus' interaction with this rich young man, and it's really, um, you know, really a, a sad scene because you know the the man goes away sad because he it says he has wealth, right? Jesus simply says to him, 
you know, this one thing you you lack, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. At this, the man's face fell and he went away sad for he had many possessions. And Jesus points out here how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. And we have to be careful, you know, if we have much and, you know, I'm sure many of us have much and, and maybe we need to reevaluate and, and realize how much we have, how good we have it. Um, that wealth, money, is a danger. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing in the sense that it comes from the hand of God, and so we have to recognize it as such and say, everything that I have, every dollar, is a gift from God, is a blessing from God. And yet, at the same time, wealth is very dangerous. As, uh, as pointed out here and several other places in the New Testament, um, it can easily lead the heart astray. This goes all the way back to the Old Testament, the days of... Uh, Moses, when he warned Israel about entering into the land, that you know they would be wealthy in the land, and this would lead their hearts away from the Lord, and to essence saying, "What need have we of God?" And uh, and so it's the danger of wealth here that it, you know to trust in riches, and to uh, to cast God to the side, and so we need to be very careful about that. The other thing in this chapter uh, comes towards the end of it, where Jesus uh, speaks about how the 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 Gentiles. The rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, but not so among you, but rather in your case, whoever wants to be first must be the slave of everyone else. Just as Jesus says, just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. And that's the call of the life of following Jesus, to do just as Jesus did and lay down your life, to give up your rights, to give up, you know, putting your own desires first. And instead to think of others before yourself, to be willing to be servant of all, to be to, to use your life to honor others rather than constantly being desiring to be honored by others. Uh, so just very important, um, you know, the reversal of the, the ethic of the kingdom of God there, that unlike the world, which celebrates self and says, everyone needs to serve me. Rather, the, the kingdom of God ethic is that we lay down our lives and we serve others and we consider others more important than ourselves. All right, then uh, flipping over to Romans chapter 10 to close out our time here. And, you know, this again is the middle of the section here of Romans 9, 10, and 11. Paul's focusing on Israel, answering this question, basically, what about Israel? Has God uh, failed to keep his promise to Israel? How is all of this working out? Because what we're seeing, you know, Paul's saying, you're seeing the Gentiles being saved. What about Israel? And he's pointing out here that uh, it's the rejection by Israel of the of Christ that has allowed the gospel to go out to the Gentiles. So it has brought um, great salvation to the Gentiles because the, the, the Jewish people missed it in Jesus' day that they were looking to the law of Moses as their means of salvation, and rather faith, and particularly faith in Christ, the Son of God. And uh, But then we have this, this wonderful section of verses here right in the middle, uh, which really calls to the need for spreading the gospel, and obviously for how one is saved. He says here in 9 and 10, If you openly declare Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is by believing in the heart that you are made righteous with God, right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. And then he goes on to talk about that how can anyone call on him in whom they have not believed, and how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him, and how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And so it goes to the heart of evangelism here that um, that we are called as followers of Jesus, great commission. To go, be that good, you know, to, to carry that good news uh, on, to, to be the one shouting from the mountaintop about Christ and sharing about uh, what he has done so that others also will believe. And people, if we want others to believe, then we need to be, we need to be telling them about Jesus. And so just so important, how does someone come into faith in Christ? It's, it's uh, by, as he says again here, um, confessing with your mouth, declaring Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart God raised him from the dead. And then that wonderful privilege we have of being able to share with others the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. All right, we got more to come from Romans next time as we conclude this section, Romans 11. But that's all we have time for today. Again, it was Genesis 40, Job 6, Mark 10, and Romans 10. Uh, until next time, keep your eyes on the Lord. 
and your nose in the book. Thanks.